Praise Jesus for air conditioning. <laughs> right? Do you know this? The, uh, apparently not that long ago there was no air conditioning in here. Could you even imagine right now? Anyway, uh, what a blessing. So, uh, good morning again, New Jersey, the state that has no spring. We're... <laughs> But it, it's all good. Hey, we're starting a new series today, and we have some guests here. Welcome. I hope you feel as welcome as you are. If you have any questions, uh, let us know. We're excited about our baptisms that are happening, happening after the sermon today. Um, but we're starting a new series, and forgive me if you've been with us for a while or, or if you're new. We're going a little inside baseball this morning, and that is just to say that we're going to look at some numbers and figures about what's happening uh, to the church in America, but I promise it's going to land somewhere that hopefully it's a place that inspires and gives us hope. Because I think the real issue is, I mean, gosh, last night I just heard about what happened in Long Branch. I don't know if any of you were tracking there. You had like a thousand kids uh, show up. I don't know if there were kids. We had a thousand young people show up from, uh, mostly from Newark, who kind of coordinated to show up there. And there were, there were fights and things were broken and the stores all had to close and they had to create a curfew. I mean, it, was, it was wild. And I was just thinking about the next, the next generation. How are we helping them to live a life of faith, to know that there's more to their story than what they believe there is? How do we as a church be messengers of hope? I was at a fundraiser yesterday, and I know some of you were there too for a youth football fundraiser. And um, one of the things that, that was said, I think applies to the work of the church, and that's this. Talking about kids from our area that are playing football, most of them, are, you know, they're not going to Division I. They're just not the super big, tall, fast. I mean, some are, but most of them, it's like, you know, they're smart, they're strong, they, they have a lot of want to. And the idea is what makes these programs in our area successful is that they have fundraisers, they have support, they have people caring about making sure they have the right equipment. And they have, it's like a scaffolding that's built around these kids' lives that helps them to succeed where they otherwise might not. And I feel like, isn't that a great example of what the church should be? We should be the scaffolding that helps families, helps kids grow and know God in this world that's filled with all sort of competing voices more than ever. And maybe we'd be a part of making change. That's what today's sermon series beginning is about. We're going to be talking about this for the next couple of weeks called Standing in the Gap as we look at the story of Nehemiah and how he provides a way to navigate, I think, these issues that we're facing. There is a book that came out in 2011 from a uh, theologian and sociologist, uh, Alan Roxburgh, called Missional. And in it, he begins uh, by talking to, he was talking about a friend that he had, was a marine biologist who was diving the Great Barrier Reef and was lamenting over the fact that the reefs of the world are, are dying. That, you know, because of sea change, the reefs of the world, what happens is they, they end up being bleached white. And, and her experience of diving, she said this. This is a quote from the book. She said, they are dying. Back, back when? Back when I got to read it, yeah. She said, they are dying, all of them, and there is nothing anyone can do about it. I can continue to swim among them as if nothing has changed, but in a generation, they'll all be dead. And he actually says, I don't know if that's all that different than what's happened to the church in America. We got a lot of people swimming around as if nothing has changed. And so they keep doing the same old, same old. They do church the way it's always been done because that's how we do it. And generations of young people being lost, falling away. Now, it's a reminder that it wasn't the reef's fault. The reefs are dying because the sea changed. The temperature changed. The pH changed. So we just acknowledge what are the changes that have happened to the church so that we can understand what we can do about it. Again, I said a little bit inside baseball, but I want to share a few things with you this morning that I think help to paint a picture. So let's talk about the church and sea change. In 2019, uh, there was some research done by Lifeway Research that laid out these statistics. It said, first, Six in ten churches in America are plateaued or declining. Six in ten, 60 percent. That's before the pandemic. So you can imagine what that number might be now. 
65% of churchgoers say they don't need other believers in order to be Christians. Now, when you're young, you know, like I remember when I was a brand new Christian, I was 19 years old, I thought I didn't need church because church was boring. Like, I could, just, I could just believe in God by myself. I discovered in my life that is impossible. <laughs> you can't just be completely untethered from church. And what do I mean church? Not the building, but a faith community. You need a faith community in order to live your faith. We, we need one another badly. But 65% of churchgoers, people who believe in church, say, I don't need this. And then in just 2019 alone, 4,500 churches closed their doors forever. That's just one year. The data in our denomination is clearly in that trend. There's a lot of bad news. And then there's the pandemic, right? The pandemic has been jet fuel. For all of this, in fact, uh, church attendance patterns, as they've gone down the last couple of decades, they said because of the pandemic, the attendance patterns that we see now in church is where we would have expected to be in 2027. The pandemic accelerated all of these trends. Now, praise God, we got people in the building, and it's wonderful. But these are challenges that all of us face in one way or another. You know what else the pandemic has been jet fuel for? Google spiritual direction. You know what I'm talking about? You don't come ask your pastor anymore. If you got a spiritual question, not usually. Just like WebMD. I'm not feeling so good. WebMD, and I find out I've got eight horrible diseases that I'm convinced I have. That's right. <laughs> uh, but same with like spiritual formation. It's like, oh, what does this mean? And that's fine. It's good that we have information. But the thing is, we have no interpretation. Like you need the faith community for interpretation. Because I'll be honest with you, if I'm left all by myself to figure stuff out, I come up with some weird conclusions. Like I need to be tethered to a community that makes sure I'm not losing it. <laughs> okay. Skepticism or hatred of religious organizations. We've all seen it. And, and the thing is, I get it. I 100% get why it's there. How many pastors you have to read about who did some awful thing, cheated on their wife, took money, I, what, I, whatever it is. Yes, people are skeptical, and I, don't, I am too. <laughs> I don't blame them. I said last week, how about the pastors wearing $2,000 sneakers to give their sermon? I'm like, I'm sorry, that's just not, that's weird. That makes me wonder, why should I give money to that church? And just a reminder, Kohl's, $39.95. <laughs> so skepticism's higher than ever. And then, you know, one of the things that, that I noticed this week, so I was down in D.C. for a, an event, and I went to the MLK Memorial, and... I was thinking about, you know, in a lot, if you've ever been there, there are a lot of quotes of his uh, that are there, and it's, it's a very moving experience. And people forget he wasn't just an activist. He was a very brilliant pastor and theologian. And when people who are skeptical of church, usually they'll say something like, Christians, they're just backwards and slow, and they don't understand, you know, unintelligent. So you're saying Martin Luther King was backwards and slow and unintelligent. He was one of the most gifted brains, not just, not just men of faith or activists, gifted minds of a generation. We got to show the world again that Christians are thoughtful and loving and use their brains, not just their hearts. Anyway, more on that later. The pandemic was jet fuel for isolation, depression, and substance abuse. All those numbers, all the data shows, that all went up during the pandemic. Now here's the part, and I promise this is the last piece of bad news. The thing that keeps me up at night is the generational disconnect. So basically, whatever generation you're in, the generation below you has less faith than your generation. Here's some stats from Barna this, uh, just this year. 43% of millennials. How many millennials do we have in here? 
It's okay, you can raise your hand. We love you. It's, that's right. We are so glad you're here because most of them aren't, so we're so glad that you're here. 43% of millennials do not believe or care if God exists. 43% of an entire generation. Wow, we have missed it. Millennials uh, came of age, most of them came of age, uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, they were part of the, the youth groups of those days, which were, a lot of people look back at that as the last sort of big wave of youth ministry uh, that we had in America. I was a youth pastor then. And a lot of those kids, they grew up in, in youth group and they had a great faith experience, but the church was so different than their youth group experience, they never went back to church. And so they just left. And, and many of them never returned. 43%. To uh, Gen Z, so my kid's generation, many of your kid's generation, is twice as likely as adults to say they are atheists. Twice as likely. The other stat, two-thirds of young people raised in Christian homes will walk away as young adults. And I think part of that's because in a, in a lot of church experiences, it's all about, do you know this Bible passage? And do you know, like, you got to know all the Bible story. It's about content when it should be about relationship. Because you get to college and you get your first professors like, did you know that, uh, and sort of bring all these kind of, facts about how the Bible is put together, and it, some, and it shakes people. What? I didn't know that. And then lastly, 65% of Gen Z agree that many religions can lead to eternal life. They, they just don't really understand, even those who are Christians don't really understand what that, what that means to follow Jesus. Why do you think this is all happening? We're going to do something a little different today. If you're new, I, we don't do this every week. It's just a thing that we're going to do today. Turn to somebody who you came with or somebody that you're sitting next to. And I want you to, like, why do you think we are where we are? Why do you think, as generations are younger, why do you think there's such a disconnect? Go ahead. Just take a minute. Talk to one another. I'd love to just hear a couple of these, and I just want to add this disclaimer. Be gentle. Right? You know, the parents are the problem. Listen, there are some parents in here who are up all night with their babies. So, like, be gentle. But, like, what are a couple of things? What are a couple of things that you, that you talked about? Just hands up. I'll just call in, like, three or four. What are some things? How did we get here? How did we get where, where we are? Patrick. Social media. Social media. Oh, I should also remind you, we are live streaming. Right? Not for nothing. Just make sure it's something you would say in front of the world. Okay. <laughs> oh, look, all the hands stop. Go ahead. Complacency and hypocrisy. Video gaming instead of doing something useful. That sounds like you've said that before. <laughs> All right, we, we got a hand in the back. Sports events on Sunday. Sports events on Sunday. Ooh, that got applause. That got applause. That's, that has definitely changed things. Yep. Yeah. And I'm sure you as a parent feel that pressure, right? It's a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Do you know what, actually, if I could kind of sum it up, I think the challenge that we're facing, like, everything you've, you've said are symptoms of the challenge. I think the challenge that we're facing is similar to what uh, comes up in Howard Schultz's book, Onward, a CEO, two-time CEO of Starbucks. Many of you know his story, but in 2008, Starbucks was floundering, if you could even imagine. They were seven months from insolvency, uh, Schultz believed. And he had a, a come-to-Jesus meeting, if you will, with store owners in New Orleans. They, this meeting became quite famous. But he asked them, how do you think we got here? Why do you think we're struggling so much? And they said, uh, oh, well, it's competition. 
Dunkin' Donuts had a big campaign out. I guess it was taking some business from them, and uh, there was another company. Okay. And what else? Oh, the economy, 2008. Remember 2008? No one wants to pay $7 for a latte or, you know. It's the economy. And as Schultz said, no, it's none of those things. As I've gone to the stores recently, what I've noticed is you're barely interacting with the people. You're barely remembering names, which has become a joke, right, about the name. Okay. You're treating them like they're just a product. You know what happened? We forgot who we're serving. We forgot our mission. I think this is the same with the church in America. We have forgotten our mission. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of Judges 2.10 which said this, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Now this is so important. Whose fault is it? It's not mama's fault. (laughs) It's the previous generation I have to remind people, the kids didn't invent the video games, we did. You're watching too much TV, Grandpa says. The Grandpa, why'd your generation invent it? It's not their fault. How do we help them know the Lord again? And and I'll, again, this is sort of the end of this section. I'll say this. I was at a family event. I want to be careful because we are broadcasting. The family event, and this is when my kids were small, and one of our relatives, my kids, we were about to eat, and my kids were said, should we pray? It was on a holiday, so should we pray? And she responded to them, what do you mean, pray? She had never heard of it. She had no idea what they were talking about. And that stings. So the question is, what are we going to do about it? That is the gist of this sermon series called Standing in the Gap. Okay. Back in 2012, if you were around here for Sandy, you remember the devastation. I I know some people in our church, their homes were damaged. Some were even destroyed. And uh, back in 2011, I don't know if you remember the Joplin tornado but it was, it occurred one block away, the edge of it was one block away from my mother-in-law's house. Her house was left completely intact. The next block flattened. We went there a couple of weeks after the tornado and we saw the aftermath. The weirdest thing that I'll never forget were that the trees were completely stripped of bark. I, I, it was a very strange visual all over Joplin. Now, could you imagine finding out that your home had been destroyed? I think about our home. It's like a sacred place, and there's memories around every corner, pencil marks in the doorway of where your kids grew and grew and grew. Could you imagine how you would feel if you experienced that? Now, in Nehemiah's story, it cuts even deeper than that. For an ancient Jewish person, their home, in every way, their spiritual home, was Jerusalem. Why? Because it's the place where God lived. That's where the temple was. It's the city that held all the pencil marks of the people of God over generations. And Nehemiah gets news that it is destroyed. It's in a state of... the. the, The walls are down and on fire. And I think we learn a lot from what Nehemiah does when he hears this. Let me uh, set the stage a little more. Nehemiah, in the 5th century before Christ, he worked in the court of the Persian king Artaxerxes I. Persia was the new superpower uh, at the time. And um, they had conquered the Babylonians who had sent the Israelites into exile. So like they conquered the conquerors and now they were in charge. And Nehemiah finds himself in a position of government. He was a Jewish man in a position of Persian government. 
So he was in the city of Susa, which is in modern-day Iran, which is really far east of where Israel is. And he had an important position. He was cupbearer to the king. So imagine the amount of trust that the king had to have in Nehemiah. And this is what happens, Nehemiah chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah, and I think appropriately, mourns over the state of things. I think we, appropriately, can mourn over the state of things in our country right now. And people are always like, well, who's the the next generation? I say, every generation younger than you. It's the next generation. I think it's appropriate to mourn and to grieve what's been lost. But if that's all we do, we are not stepping into what God wants for us or for the world. Now watch what Nehemiah does. Then I said, and he he makes this his prayer, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. So his whole prayer, it starts with confession. I confess that in, in whatever way that I've been a part of Jerusalem being like it is, I just confess to you, but I remember your promises, O God. And I say this, I want to use my position that I have in in this Persian government to persuade the king to do something about the state of Jerusalem. Like, please, let me have an audience with the king who trusts me to do something about what I heard with God's people. Listen, I think there are a lot of important things to take from here, and we'll definitely get to them as we go through the book of Nehemiah. But two things I want to point out right off the bat. The first is, when our faith is challenged, we don't throw our hands in the air and give up. We go to our knees and pray up. Whether it's the generational disconnect that we see, whether it's all the other things happening in the world that we see, it's okay to mourn and to grieve, but God's people are about doing something about it. And then second... We use everything at our disposal and wherever God has placed us, whatever influence we have, whatever our circumstance, to do his work. I'm a farmer. I'm going to do whatever I can to help the kingdom of God, help things rebuild. I'm an engineer. I'm going to do everything I can. I'm a school teacher. I'm going to do everything I can. I'm a stay-at-home parent. I'm going to do everything I can. I I am where God has put me, and I'm going to leverage this place to do something about the rebuilding. 
It's appropriate and important to mourn what is lost, but then we must get to the work of rebuilding. And here's the thing about rebuilding work. If you've ever done this in your life or in your house, you've done a renovation project, we usually build back better than it was before, don't we? Hey, while we're at it, honey, maybe we should add a couple of feet. Hey, while we're at it, maybe we want these floors. Oh, yeah, that'd be nice, since we're doing it anyway. Listen, I'm going to tell you something, and this is what I'm excited about. Yeah, there's a lot of bad news out there. What are you going to do? There's always bad news. But here's what I will say. I think we're going to see in America the greatest revival of the Christian faith that we have seen at least in my lifetime. Right now. Why do I think that? Because as as things have gone off the rails, people are realizing that what they're missing is something much deeper than they thought. They're missing a relationship with God. And we need to be back to the scaffolding. We need to be the scaffolding to help them to find him. Here's the beautiful thing. 2013, off the coast of the Philippines, some divers went out to go check on this coral reef that had been completely devastated, completely bleached, no life, to find that it started to come back. Why? It adapted to the new environment. I think we churches can adapt to the new environment and flourish again, not for our sake, but for the sake of the world. You know what I want the next generation of kids to say? Is that if we're praying at a meal or we forget to pray, I want them to say, what do you mean not pray? That's what we do. Amen.